And now we get to the fun stuff. Everybody that studies physics, they want to learn the fun stuff, the black holes, the dark matter. The problem is, you really got to study for like a long time to get to the fun stuff. And by the time you get to it, it may not be so fun. <laughs> but uh, anyway, we have now talked a little bit about enough, a little bit about gravity enough to talk about a couple of things. So let's look at a very simple calculation you can do to think about what a black hole is. And I think this will help us understand um, the potential a little bit as well. So we already calculated the escape velocity um, to get out of a potential well. So say you've got a mass here, and we know it creates a potential well. If we say here is um, the radius to go away, we know that that potential goes to negative infinity, right? It's minus 1 over r. So it goes way down. And that's because we treat it as a point mass. You treat it as though you can get as close as you want, but really you can only get to the surface. So what I want to stress is it's not just the mass that affects how hard it is to get off of something or how fast you have to go. It's also the size. Basically any mass, if you shrunk it down to a point particle, you need infinite velocity to escape. So let's remember what that formula was. It was a square root of 2gm over r. So the velocity escape the square root of 2, gravitational constant, the mass of the object, I'll put a capital M since it's a big mass, over the radius of the object, which is where you're starting from. Okay. So over the Earth, that was 11 kilometers per second. Now, uh, another part of physics is you can't always go faster and faster and faster. There's a limit to how fast you can go, right? The speed of light. Fastest thing in the universe is light. Speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So it would seem reasonable then to say you can't go as fast as you want. Your escape velocity can only go to the speed of light. So the largest v escape is c. And c is what we call, is the symbol we use for the speed of light. So we can say c equals the square root of 2 big G m over r. And this tells us uh, sort of the radius of the black hole or the radius of the event horizon, right? If we, if we say we have something with a mass m, like a star or a planet, whatever it is, and we turn this around and solve it for r, we get this up here, we get 2gm over c squared. r equals 2gm over the speed of light squared. And this sort of represents doesn't have to be the size of the object to become a black hole. This represents how close you can get and still get away. Right? If you get closer than this, then uh, let's, let's say we have some mass here, some really big mass. Okay? And let's say that if you calculate this r, it's bigger than the object's size. Right? So this we'll call put rs for the Schwarzschild radius. I won't try to spell that. Right? So here we'll say this is rs. And this is sort of the event horizon of the black hole. As long as you're outside of Rs, you can in principle escape if you can get enough kinetic energy going. But if you fall inside Rs, you can never escape, and not even light can escape. And that's why it's called a black hole. Now, there are much more complicated field theory ways to calculate this quantity, and in the end you get the same thing. So this is just a lucky happenstance that the simple freshman physics calculation gives you this number. There's a lot more to black holes than this, is what I want to make clear. But this also tells you an interesting uh, thing to, to think about, is that any mass could become a black hole if it became small enough. So our sun is not a black hole, fortunately, because we need some light coming out of the sun. Uh, but if it shrunk down to, I think it's a few kilometers, it would be a black hole. All you got to do is plug the numbers in here. The Earth, any mass could be a black hole, has enough mass. But if the Earth would have to shrink down to, I think, 9 millimeters across, you can run the numbers. Right? So if the Earth shrunk down to, say, 3 millimeters, you could get, you'd, have to get, you'd have to stay at least 9 millimeters away, or you would fall past the event horizon, and you would never, never, never come out. So, we, so even this simple concept can be applied uh, to black holes. The other one that's very popular I don't know what it is about things that are dark and black that attract physicists so much, it is the dark matter, right? What's the deal with the dark matter? Well, even with our freshman physics, we can kind of think about dark matter because we have calculated orbital velocity or speed. I guess I should say speed because it's going in a circle. 
And I don't know if I ever actually wrote it down like this. It was V is the square root of G, mass of the Earth, if it's going around the Earth, over um, R. I'll just take that off. Around any planet or any object. Uh, that tells you how fast something's going to orbit. And it depends on how far out you are, how fast you go. You get really far out, you go slower. You get really close, you got to go faster. So uh, what we can do is see how that uh, varies uh, for different planets, right? So we can make a plot like this of the different planets because the M here, oh, I'm sorry, that's the M of the sun. <laughs> that's not the mass of, of the object. That's the mass of the sun that's creating um, uh, the field uh, that everything's moving in. So all the planets in our solar system are moving in the Earth's or the sun's gravitational field. Therefore, they all sort of fall on the same curve. If we were to plot this V, this orbital speed, versus R, of where the different planets are, they fall on a curve like this. Right? So here's you know, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, Uranus, Pluto. What's the deal on that? I don't know. It changes every week. Pluto, like that. And they all fall on a nice curve because it's all defined by the mass of the sun. But then you go and look at the stars in a galaxy, right? So similar idea. We can plot how fast they're going around their orbit versus their radius. And we can make this same curve because we know roughly the mass of the massive huge thing in the center of the galaxy. So you make the same curve, right? Like that. And you look at the star velocities and they're just like this. They aren't following the curve. So why? I don't know. You could say, well, maybe this mass is just off. Eh, maybe. But then what's that going to do? That's still going to give you a curve. It's just going to shift the curve around, right? You can go with a whole list of things that might be wrong. Oh, maybe gravity works different, long, whatever, blah, blah, blah. They've checked all those things. Uh, it seems that the real experts in this field say that the main explanation is that there's just more mass in the galaxy distributed in some way that we don't know what it is. So that's what's called the dark matter. There's matter that we can't see. We don't know what it is. Now, I think that it also helps, that it helps justify a huge search, right? Uh, at the big uh, particle uh, high energy physics experiments. There's some mass out there that we don't know about, so we've got to keep looking for it. But uh, to date, I don't know the latest promising signs of what dark matter is, but there's clearly something going on with the motion of stars around galaxies that doesn't quite make sense with the matter that we know about. <laughs>